Thank you. Well, good uh, morning and good afternoon to all our participants. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is um, the or maybe fourth uh, one of these uh, webinars series that we're, we're holding with the community to talk about uh, astrobiology. Uh, today we'll be talking about uh, the early evolution of life and uh, the biosphere. So if that doesn't ring any bells with you, you might be in the wrong. Well, uh, we're going to run for war, and we are going to see the panel in front of you now. They're going to introduce themselves uh, very shortly. We have a series of questions which are designed to stimulate conversation amongst the, um, the, the community. Um, we'll probably talk for the panel for maybe about 30 minutes, uh, and we'll open up the, uh, the microphones uh, to, uh, to engage the audience. What the presenters are presenting, we thoroughly encourage you, please, to um, step into the open chat window. You should see that on the left-hand side of your um, screen. Uh, please uh, please uh, engage in conversation there. My colleague, David Lomas, will be uh, picking through there and trying to uh, pick out useful uh, and interesting comments, which he will then transpose into the live notes area, which we will use a little bit later after this event. Um, if you have any questions at any stage, uh, we, we uh, would ask you to put it into the uh, open chat window. We would ask you to keep your microphones closed for this moment. And when we come to the Q&A session in a short while, uh, we'll ask you to raise your hand in the attendees window. There's a little icon at the top of your screen for raising your hand. And then we can draw you into the conference and uh, you, we can speak live with you then. Uh, so hopefully that, uh, that sort of sets the scene. Uh, Michael, can I hand across to you to uh, give us a little bit of context about this, uh, this particular webinar? Hi, everybody. I'm Michael New. I'm the Astrobiology Discipline Scientist at NASA Headquarters, and I'm one of the people at NASA Headquarters who uh, are eagerly awaiting the outcome of this webinar as well as the previous webinars and the online discussion. Um, we are – so the purpose of this webinar is to talk about some uh, – Big, some big questions in the early evolution of life and the biosphere. Now, by this, we tend to think of um, life on Earth or anywhere else uh, not just evolving on some fixed physical substrate, but actually co-evolving with that substrate. So the way to think about it, or an example rather, is you look at the early Earth. Well, the early Earth, we think, had very little or no oxygen in, its at in the atmosphere. That oxygen came from life. So we had a, an oxic atmosphere, and that led to a bunch of geochemical cycles of, of various metals and, and other elements. And then uh, life figured out how to do uh, oxygenic photosynthesis, and all of a sudden there was all this nasty toxic oxygen everywhere. This not only drove the evolution of the biology, it also changed all the geochemical cycles, or many of them. And so the purpose of, of this webinars to begin uh, our online conversation about what are the compelling questions facing us for the next decade or so in this area of the early evolution of life and its co-evolution with the biosphere. Um, we are hoping you will all take a vigorous part in this discussion today, now, as well as in the online part of it. There are discussion fora that will be open after this, dealing with major questions. We and we're going to, and there's two reasons to participate in those this online discussions. The first is that, um, you know, what you say will affect what we think, and the people who, in the end of the day, are going to be writing the roadmap are going to be listening and reading. More importantly, we're going to be picking some of those people from active, interesting participants in the online discussion. And so this gives you an even more direct route into writing the, the roadmap. So without any further ado, uh, if there are, unless there are any questions, I will be happy to turn this over to, um, to back to Tim and our panelists. Thank you very much, Michael. I think before we start, could we just have a little introduction from our, our panel, Diane, Tim, and Dave? Uh, if we, Diane, could you kick us off? Sure. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining this. We have designed the questions for our discussion today wanting to hear from you. We really don't want to do a lot of talking. Our goal is to make this an open discussion so that we get new ideas, and that's why the opening questions are very broad. So we really encourage you to please speak up 
and let us know what you think. Um, my background, I should introduce myself, sorry. Uh, I work at Caltech um, in Pasadena, California. I'm also an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and I'm a molecular geobiologist, and by that I mean I'm somebody who studies modern microorganisms with molecular genetic and cellular biological tools uh, with the hope of understanding how it is that modern bacteria catalyze processes that are of relevance both to modern geochemical cycles and also of relevance to helping us interpret ancient um, imprints of microorganisms, be they in the form of biomarkers that are organic or larger um, biosignatures that are inorganic. So that's my introduction. I'm going to sign off now. This is Tim Lyons. Very much. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, this is Tim Lyons, and I would um, I, w I welcome you all also, and thank you for participating. And I would echo her comments that uh, that she and Dave and I will have a lot of time to talk offline about these things. And so the point here is really to get your feedback. So please do that. And for those of you that I don't know, I'm a biogeochemist at the University of California Riverside. I work with a wide range of elemental and isotopic approaches towards basic questions about the earliest oxygenation of the ocean and atmosphere. Um, this work often involves novel proxies, including sulfur and trace metal concentrations and increasingly isotopic approaches with metals that are first are often developed and validated and calibrated in modern oxygen deficient settings. And this work is all done really with the goal of providing a backdrop for the early evolution of life and including the first appearance of oxygenic photosynthesis and the first appearance and diversification of, of eukaryotes and ultimately animals. And so it's all about feedbacks and tipping points controls on early habitability and specifically the cause and effect relationship with the, uh, between the evolving environment and, as Michael noted, the co-evolution of, of life and its diversity. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dave. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks to everybody for joining as well. Um, my name is Dave Johnson. I'm an isotope geobiologist at Harvard, and I use uh, a mixture of kind of tools like Tim uses and uh, tools like Diane uses to try to reconstruct value environments. And so that, that kind of takes me into, a little bit into uh, microbial ecology, where we look to study rate laws and physiology of organisms and how that translates to isotope records, and then also going out and working in sedimentary basins from the Precambrian to try to then reconstruct isotope records through those environments, and then we use some modeling to bridge between the two. So with that, we can, we can get started. Thanks. Thanks very much, Dave, Tim, and Diane. Uh, let's let's kick straight off into the uh, into the big questions. And these are questions that have arisen from uh, a whole a whole line of questions. Uh, these are decided as probably most interesting for the moment. So, could I kick off with this first question? What types of approaches are needed to answer mechanistic questions about the early evolution of life in the biosphere? Um, anyone want to start us with that? Okay, now I'm not hearing anybody. I'm just hearing mm -hmm. cricket chirping. Come on, there's like 20 people involved in this. Somebody <laughs> must have something to say. So, can we start with Diane, please? Diane, why is this an important question? I think this is an important question because we've had a real revolution in um, technical capabilities that bear on biological problems within the past decade, both at the level of an explosion of sequencing capability as well as improvements in our analytical abilities um, with regard to detecting uh, a whole variety of isotopes um, at very small uh, levels of spatial resolution. Those are just two examples. And I think with these advances in technologies comes uh, this question, which is there are many really interesting topics in the field of geobiology, and we need to be clear, I think, in regard to which questions require certain types of approaches. And so, as an example, just to get the discussion going, I would say that if one is trying to understand um, the meaning of an ancient biomarker, for instance, 
it is really vital to understand the function of that biomarker in living cells. And the only way we can really understand function is through doing work with modern organisms at the physiological uh, level, and oftentimes we require mutants um, so that we can isolate particular genes that are important for encoding the machinery necessary to make those biomarkers. And once we delete them, then we have mutants at our disposal that we can interrogate in many ways to try to identify what the absence of these molecules uh, does for the organism that produces them. And by, by these type of approaches, we can get a much clearer understanding of what the biomarkers actually do for the cells that produce them. And I think that this is necessary in order to have a rigorous interpretation of, of what these molecules mean in the rock record. So that's just one example, and I think it would be good to get a discussion going about um, that and any other examples that people um, would like to talk about. Thank you. Tim, Dave, do you have a comment on this? Uh, well, I could, but it seems like there might be people who were getting a lot of typing, and it would be nice to have real-time oral exchange with this, too, I think, yes? Yeah, and I see that Mike Tice has actually raised his hand. Yeah. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Absolutely. Yeah, the, the line's open, Mike, if you want to speak. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'll agree with it, with what Diane said and, and add that for much of the time where um, many of these questions are relevant, we have very little uh, material actually preserved. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think it's fruitful to, to think about what are the high volume records uh, for time when the oxygenic post might, might have been involved in other things. And uh, unfortunately, I think it's been very difficult to apply um, a lot of what has been done thinking about the deep mechanisms of how organisms work for that record as of yet. I think something that's really required in the, in the near future is for, for people who think about mechanisms and for people who work with the rock records to collaborate with modelers um, who can help us test hypotheses, hypotheses about how very small-scale processes work their way into highly visible products in the rock record, essentially, like where you might send rovers on Mars, for instance. Um, so that we know how to scale from, from uh, things that are small and of biological interest to, to things that are large and observable in poorly preserved rock. Okay, can any... Yes, Dominic, we hear you. Is Dominic my microphone Bettino? on now? This is Dominic Bettino. <laughs> okay, this is complicated. <laughs> I don't know if it's if it's on when it's red or white. But in any case, I wanted to interject because I think that Diane uh, uh, mentioned something very important about uh, the advancement of uh, microanalytical techniques and very specific instruments that are increasingly being used by uh, members of our community as well as members of the geobiology community at large. Uh, last year, I was part of a uh, of an effort to redefine or to kind of give the greater guidelines of the, what the geobiology program would be uh, or, or ought to be at uh, at NSF and in a symposium in uh, in Washington D.C. and I proposed the field of nanogeobiology, and I and I'd like to kind of rephrase it as nanobiogeochemistry, which I think is probably the most the most exciting approach. Uh, and, and of course, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from my own from my own background, and I'm preaching for my own uh, church here uh, in a, in a way. But uh, overall, I I think that that but the, the dire need here from from everything that that everyone uh, seems to have discussed in the forums online is converging towards Mars. We want to know what the origin of life is on Earth, how to recognize biomolecules on the early Earth, as an example, to finding. Uh, to hopefully finding them on Mars, and clearly the whole Mars and, uh, Mars exploration program is, is of utmost relevance to astrobiology. So I think that 
that if the efforts of the astrobiology community were to support a Mars sample return, I think that, that this would be the timing. I mean, it's, it's timely with respect to the, to the Russians and the Chinese who want to send uh, Mars sample return missions, robotic Mars sample return missions over the, 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 the next decade or, or 15 years, decade and a half. And of course, it's, it's huge. I mean, we're talking about a huge project, a Mars sample return mission. But the, the, the crux of the matter remains how are we going to analyze these, how are we going to prepare to analyze these samples. We need a, a P4 laboratory enclosed in a, in a class 100 clean room, and we need uh, like these, these, uh, these astronaut scientists, if you wish, working in a facility that they're completely protected from any potential pathogens from, for planetary uh, protection uh, consideration. But uh, a project like this, uh, that, that I did detail uh, in a lot more detail than I'm going to have time to talk to you because I realize I'm, I'm talking a lot, but uh, it, it's all detailed in a forum for the, the, the Planetary Biosafety Microanalysis Laboratory that I contributed online. So anyways, my ideas are there, and, and, and I think that there would be a potentially huge EPO splash, uh, education public outreach, as well as, as, as a tre tremendous opportunity for the whole geobiology community, the whole uh, Precambrian biogeochemistry community, but also the cosmochemistry communities, the Mars community, and uh, uh, as well as the virologists and molecular biologists, because I think that some of the instruments that should be enclosed in such a P4 uh, uh, biosafety level class, uh, class 100 clean room, these instruments should be, uh, should be instruments that are very versatile for a range of different analyses. In terms of, of uh, what Diane talked about, I think that, that, uh, that Diane uh, mentioned very clearly that there's an, a, an increased recognition that instruments today are, are offering possibilities that they were not offering before, and we have to seize that opportunity while you know, we're still developing the approach. But a, a top sims would be a very good for organic biomarkers, as uh, Diane is raising her hand. I'm sorry, I speak too much. But and anyway, the list of instrument would include a, 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 a TEM with a, a cryo stage, a, a focused ion beam with a, with a cryo stage, as well as a laser Raman, FDIR, uh, optical microscopes, nanosims, and uh, yeah, a top sim, like I said. Yep. I, I, I think all this enclosed in a facility like this would be a very good, uh, noble goal for NASA Can to I? purge all the disciplines that we represent. Can I, just ask the, the, can I just ask Diane to respond to that? Diane, you had a response? I would just um, like, I agree with you, everything you're saying. I think it'll be even more helpful if you can uh, frame very specific types of questions where this type of microanalysis is essential. I think it depends on the question, and it's important to be very clear what types of questions absolutely require this and, and, what, and what those questions are. Thank you, Diane. We're going to uh, move on to another question shortly, but uh, before we do so, Dave, did you have a, a comment on our first question here? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up briefly on some of the chatter that's going on in the open chat as well. So one of the things that, uh, that I think is at the heart of both what Diane was saying and Dominic's point is that we have these micro scales of analysis that are now available to us. And one of the things that I've, I've struggled with, and I'm curious if the community feels similarly, is that we often take an interpretive framework based on a whole rock or hand sample size sample and then try to apply it to these very, very small scale measurements. And so, and also to a comment that uh, I believe Mark Tice made that modeling or having some quantitative framework to bridge measuring something on the net up scale to a process oriented interpretation at the ocean scale or the atmosphere scale it seems like uh, an area of opportunity. And so, that's kind of what my notes say, and I'm curious if, if others feel the same way. We can move on to another question as well, if folks want. Thank you very much. And I see that Omar has his hand up, but Omar, if you could just bear with us for a moment, we'll come to an open mic in a short while. I'd like to move the conversation to our second, uh, our second uh, open panel question. Are there problems you think that are vital to understanding the early evolution of life and the biosphere that have not yet been articulated by NASA? I'm wondering, Tim, could you start us off why you think this is an important question? Yeah, and I think it sort of follows up on, on, the, on the previous question. I, I too think that it's, it's I, for me, there's really been a renaissance that started in the 
in the late 90s, and I think it, that was motivated in part by a, a, an evolving array of proxies that were addressing fundamental questions about early Earth oxygen evolution in particular, but tied to that are methane and many other components of the atmosphere that play essential roles in maintaining habitability. And so there was there was instrumentation, but there was also a lot of coupling to experimental work. And so I worry a little bit. I, I, the microanalytical obviously is essential, and the scale of observation is essential. And, and a lot of those those um, approaches are motivated by rover technology and things we might be able to do in situ on another planet. But I also worry a little bit about forest for trees, and so many of the answers um, that have come so far have have not just been, and in many cases have not been. Um, the advances have not come from microanalytical techniques, but simply new ways of trying to quantify what the ocean and atmospheric chemistry were, including non-mass dependent sulfur fractionations and metal mass balances, and in some cases relatively simple approaches that have been taken in new directions uh, to try and quantify. So the biggest question in earlier studies is not measuring presence or absence anymore, but trying to quantify what the composition of the ocean and atmosphere were. And so I, I, I continue to think that fundamental questions that we have are are about when did oxygen first appear. We've been asking those questions, but we need to continue to do that. And um, and I think also proxies that allow us to better understand what the more comprehensive composition of the atmosphere was as we try and understand greenhouse warming capabilities of the atmosphere and so forth are, are really essential here. Um, and I also... I, I worry a little bit if we steer the, the conversation too much towards Mars and sample return. I personally am very interested in icy moons, as I know many other people are. And the last question will address this, but I'm also very, very interested in, in exoplanets. And so the, the early Earth provides a wonderful experiment in, in, in the face of a faint sun and understanding and an evolving faint sun. So it gives us a range of conditions over which we can understand how liquid water was maintained and how life evolved and co-evolved and drove our environmental change and this incredible array of feedbacks that we had through Earth's history that allowed the Earth to ma maintain a very special place um, in its, in its history, uh, for the history of life. And so um, I guess I ask as people address this second question to think, to think broadly and not get too narrow towards Mars and microanalyses. I'll stop there. Thank you. Deanne, did I see you nodding there? Yes, I support what Tim said. I think it's important that we try to be, um, you know, broad in our thinking about questions, um, and take a view for, you know, the sake of a funding regime right now where we're quite limited. We want as a community to try to collectively agree on things that are actually important um, and not get too parochial in, in how we we think about these questions. So that's just encouragement to give us your best ideas, whether it's, you know, within your particular domain of what you've been doing or even better, you know, you know, being broad and thinking about what's going to be exciting intellectually going forward for the next decade or more. Thank you. How about Dave Johnson? I think my co-leaders have hit the nail on the head, so we can just keep chatting. Fabulous. Well, in that case, let's let's uh, press on through because we can come back to these in a short while with open mics from other people. Our third question here. How has exponential growth of discovery and understanding of extra planets impacted? Um, can we give people yeah. can we give people time to respond? I think that we're you know plowing through these questions and sometimes it takes people a little while to collect their thoughts. So can we just wait for thirty seconds and have somebody put something out? Most certainly. Uh, there are plenty of questions coming through and uh, some of them being transferred across to the live notes. So this is just encouragement. Maybe Jake Bailey, can you pick up your mic and talk or anyone else? It would be great if we could hear you. I think it's harder for everybody to focus on the open chats at the same time we're having a conversation. So anybody who wants to take what you're writing in chat and speak, that would be really helpful. Thank you. 
just a quick follow-up on that. This is Mike. Um, you can use the raise hand feature to let us know you want to speak, and that's located at the top of the screen. There's an icon of a person raising their hand. Just click that, select raise hand, and then we will open up the telecom line. Thanks. All right, let's take, uh, let's take Jake then. Hi, I, I just wanted to make the point that uh, the early carbon and oxygen and sulfur has really been a focus and lots of great work has been done on that, but not so much has been done on uh, phosphorus and nitrogen, um, in part because nitrogen is difficult to preserve, but I think potentially as a community we could somehow focus more on maybe developing um, an interest in nitrogen and maybe technology that can be used to get at early nitrogen cycling. Maybe I can just expand on that. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree, and I think many of the, the models for understanding the steps in oxygenation in the early Earth require a deep understanding of nutrient cycling um, and, and, and protracted nutrient limitations that may shift in their nature through time and the tipping points that are required to get from one regime to another, I think, most famously, of the, getting from the mid-proterozoic to the neoproterozoic. And so I guess I would I would go beyond just nitrogen and phosphorus, and I would talk a lot about micronutrients as well that may, for example, drive the nitrogen cycle. And so we and many other people are involved in trying to glean quantitatively as, as much as possible the metal distributions through Earth history. And so the, those questions of nutrients as, as tied to carbon and oxygen and sulfur, they're all intricately linked, obviously. Um, it's really essential, and there's... There's been correspondingly little, I think, um, work done on phosphorus in particular. A lot of people are thinking about controls on nitrogen, but phosphorus maybe has fallen through the cracks a bit. Thank you, Tim. And Dominic has a question as well. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, so I'm lowering my hand. Uh, I just wanted to comment on uh, Tim's uh, previous comment uh, that uh, we should steer away from Mars because the other uh, solar planetary satellites are, are also interesting. I don't deny that, but I think that to answer the most fundamental and central questions of astrobiology and probably of all human time has been, is there life outside Earth elsewhere in the universe? And the way to answer that is wait for SETI to contact us or that they come here, which is not a good idea, and then, or that we go and try to find it. And Mars turns out to be the closest target with the highest potential, and it is the closest target both time-wise and financial-wise. So I, 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 I just think it would be a mistake to move astrobiology away from Mars and go in the outer solar system when we know very well that a Mars sample return 10 years ago was maybe 4 or 5 billion, and now it's probably increased to 15, 12 billion in today's money. Uh, of course, it's a huge undertaking for NASA, but over the years, the money can be spent wisely, and a facility like what I'm proposing, that P-ball facility, that would house the instrument I, I enumerated before, would uh, enable a lot of the analyses that are being discussed right now and open new fields, and, and thinking of, of one of our pioneer founders, uh, Barry Bloomberg, uh, the virology has been underrepresented since uh, his, uh, his passing, and uh, he, he contributed immensely to the, to the field of medicine, and I think that there's also significant contributions to be made to the field of medicine, but also public health with a P4 biosafety, uh, planetary biosafety microanalysis laboratory, because we don't really know what kind of, uh, antigens any viruses have can I, or biomarkers that can be detected by the techniques that, that I envision. Yeah, go ahead. It looks like Tim, can I, can I ask Tim to come in here? I think Tim has... Hey, I just want to respond. I certainly am not trying to steer anything away from Mars. I'm Mars-friendly as much as anyone. I just think that we need to cast a big net, especially early on in these discussions. And one of the points of defining a roadmap is to laying a framework of questions that may may precipitate questions that we can't even think about asking now. So if you keep it general and think, what are the fundamental things that we need to know about not only history on Earth, but obviously how that allows us to inform exploration for life on Mars and many other places. And so I just, I just caution, it's my personal perspective, but caution us all not to focus too much on small analyses on one planet. And, and I think whatever we talk about speaks to Mars, and we can certainly steer the conversation towards Mars. But I personally, again, speaking for myself, would like to hear a lot of clever things that maybe I've never heard before. And, um, and 
Absolutely. Everything you've said about Mars is true. And and that may be the next five and ten years and whatever many years, and that may remain the essential priority, but it may not also. And the part of the goal here is to find out what those should, things should be. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Tim. Dave, did you have something you were going to say then, Dave Johnson? I was actually just going to circle back around to where this, this portion of the conversation started with looking at nutrient cycles and things like that. And, you know, our, our understanding is lean because these are tough systems to try to sort out how to quantify or how to get at. And so I, was, I just posed the question in the open chat as to whether people think we just need to, to keep hammering on the geologic record and making measurements or it, is it are we missing missing the mark altogether and we need new approaches or are there ideas for how we can go about trying to access some of these more cryptic element cycles in the Archean in particular that we know are hugely important but a little bit less tractable in terms of a classic sediment geochemistry context. So I just can put that out there. Thank you. And there are lots of questions coming through on the open chat here. I don't know if it's uh, if we want to address those directly now. I, I want to make sure we don't miss our last question and then have an open discussion at the end of this. So if you don't mind, maybe we could look to our third question in our list of uh, uh, points that we drew out earlier. How has the exponential growth in our discovery and understanding of exoplanets impacted the kinds of questions and information we extract from early Earth record? Can someone on our panel start us off with that? Well, I, I'll say just a few things. Um, I'm sure, like like many of you, I get excited every time there's a new discovery, and 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 they happen, and they happen fast. And and I, you know, we're in an exponential growth phase in our understanding of these systems, and so I, I find that very exciting. I also think that it resonates really well with the public. Um, my my computer opens to the NPR webpage, like I'm sure many of you, and uh, and I very often see the latest exoplanet announcements highlighted on the NPR webpage. And so I, I think that um, you know one of the fundamental frontiers is understanding, obviously, the zone of habitability. And obviously, we've gone far beyond just needing to, to infer the distance from a planet's sun. But it's become so essential to try and understand the associated atmospheres. And some of the most exciting work in earlier studies is not just understanding when oxygen was first produced and how it first accumulated and and then how it grew further to support different kinds of life, but what the associated loss of other gases, for example, methane, were um, in, in, in parallel with that and the huge climatic effects that happened likely in association with, with shifting fundamentally redox. And, and so as we understand these, these greenhouse climates and, and, and the, the feedback, and in essence what happens is we, we developed an atmosphere that was less favorable to methane while well, happily our sun was becoming brighter, and so there was an offsetting effect. And so those are, those are really interesting scenarios that, uh, that need to be fully understand, understood as we think about the, the broad range of habitability for, for any planet, including ours, but any exoplanet in, in relation to its distance from its sun. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Tim. Dion, Dave? Well, maybe just to keep things rolling, one of the things that I've, I've been thinking about recently is just what we can do beyond looking for biogenic trace gases or kind of observing atmospheres, if there are other thought experiments that we can run to try to better bring the sort of early Earth questions that we think about most often to this expanding catalog of, of exoplanets. So that's certainly a place for a lot of excitement right now. So if we could build those bridges in ways that's meaningful and thoughtful, I think that there's a lot to be gained. I would just say that the wonderful thing about the exoplanets is that it forces us to go back to basic principles regarding what is life and to think through sources for um, both energy generation and also um, what would be needed to build biomass in a way that isn't biased uh, but sort of comes at it um, you know, from a, a very open-minded perspective. and. I'm looking at the online chat in real time as we're having this discussion, and I, I notice that there are a lot of people chiming in regarding the importance of doing work with modern um, organisms to understand, for example, trace elements that are key micronutrients and enzymes um, 
well, they're micronutrients because they, they go into enzymes as, as metal cofactors, for example, and that when we're talking about exoplanets or life wherever it is, be it on the early Earth or an exoplanet, um, again, it comes back to having a very precise um, and well-informed understanding of what life is about today and what types of things are possible. And I guess I would invite anybody who is typing these comments to also get on the phone and expand upon what you're, you're typing so everybody can hear. And if I could just build on that, these conversations, these questions will be on the website, the astrobiologyfuture.org website. And so we encourage everybody to, uh, as many people as, uh, as we can, to get involved in those conversations on the website uh, now and after this event. A, trans, a trans, uh, transpose of this uh, open chat will be on that site as soon as this um, uh, conference is over. I see um, one comment I would like to call out that I think is interesting where there isn't as much um, emphasis, at least as, as far as I'm aware, and that is experimental taphonomy. So much of what we do is look at ancient biosignatures, and we often make a jump from experiments we do in the modern to things that occurred billions of years ago without a lot of understanding how we get from now to then. And so I'm curious what type of um, work would fall underneath that umbrella. That is the umbrella of experimental taphonomy. What are people thinking would be useful uh, for NASA to support in order for us to gain a deeper understanding of ancient biomarkers? Okay, we have a couple of hands up. Uh, sorry, Tim, did you want to respond to that first? Well, I, let me just, just very quickly, uh, while people are, are thinking and typing, I, I was going to follow up before it scrolls too far up. And, and up, 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 up. The comment about plate tectonics is also really, really essential, and it's something we barely ever think about. If you look at the Earth as a habitable planet, maybe the single most essential part of it is plate tectonics in terms of gases that come out and buffer oxygen or don't, and also the essential recycling of nutrients. We wouldn't be who we are today if it weren't plate tectonics. And so any di ideas of, of how to explore for the possibility of that, further, obviously people are looking at, at within our solar system but beyond would be incredibly intriguing. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Can we ask Mike Tice to uh, switch his mic on and... Uh and speak, please. His hand is raised. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, just briefly, I'll say amen to what Tim just said. Um, but then I, I just had a comment about um, using modern microorganisms to understand constraints and, and other things. And I, I think this is wonderful and necessary. The thing that, that constantly scares me is um, how little we may know or not know about what modern microorganisms on Earth do as a matter of biological necessity and how much is a matter of uh, historical contingency, uh, both for unpacking the early geologic record of life and for understanding life on other plants, potentially. Um, and, you know, certainly you can imagine ways to, to work on that kind of a problem. But, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to maybe think a bit about how to uh, how to go into the geologic record and ask, are there fundamentally different ways that, that organisms did things than what we see in modern, the, the modern successful preserved descendants? How, how do we approach that, Mike? Well, you know, I'm, I'm raising that as, a, as something I think is an important question. Um, I'm not saying that there's necessarily an easy solution that, that maybe we ought to be funneling dollars into at the moment, but certainly, uh, you know, we need to be very careful when we probe the geologic record that, that we understand what is a signal of the, the sort of black box process that we're interested in and what is telling us about how the organism actually accomplished it, you know, if that makes sense. Does, does that kind of get what you're asking, Dan? Uh, sort of. I, I realize it's a very hard question, and I think your point's very good. Um, but I guess where I'm trying to push you is to be a little bit more specific in how one can 
deal with um, that problem if you have any specific thoughts. If not, we can, you know, think you think harder about it and, and give input at a later time. So, so, so let me let me give some analogies here. Um, you know, sort of with, with macroorganisms, it's fairly easy. We can look into the record and see things that didn't have, for instance, five digits on hand. Um, with microorganisms, it's, it's quite a bit more complex, and, and there we can, you know, with with photosynthesis, we're we're starting to do this, where we go in and look for um, potential places where organisms were using, say, different electron acceptors. Uh, Excuse me, electron donors for, for photosynthesis. Um, you know, I, I, I think probably mostly about the geologic record, and so I, I tend to see a lot of the challenges there. I'm, I'm wondering if maybe some folks who, who think in the lab and, and think molecularly uh, would also have some insights into that. Can I? Thank you, Mike. Can I can I bring Jake into the conversation? He has his uh, arm raised. Mike, you can put your arm down now if you want. Thank you. Uh, hello. I just wanted to make the point that uh, before we can sort of apply biosignatures um, to ancient systems, either on the Earth or on other planets, we need to kind of subject those those potential modern modern biosignatures to the kind of pressure and temperature conditions that they would experience after burial. And so this might involve some use of either high temperature or pressure experiments to try to subject uh, you know, our modern signatures to the kind of conditions that they, that they would experience before ultimately being preserved in either rocks on Earth or on Mars or other planets, potentially. Thank you, Jake. Paula, you have your arm raised. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Okay. Um, just to um, um, expand on Jake's comment, um, as a modern microbiologist, I study a lot of um, microorganisms in the lab that have been cultured in the lab for many years, and we look at the biomarkers and what their function might be. And a question that I often get a lot of times from students is, is how do we correlate that to the past? And I think this gets to what Diane was saying. And my thinking has always been that if we can, if we first determine what these molecules are doing in an organism, in, in the lab, we can then expand out into environments that we consider um, analogs for, just for, an, as an example. And then ask in newly cultured organisms that have been in the environment, are these, um, molecules being used in the same way. And that brings us into connection from the lab into the environment. And then we can even use more modern molecular techniques, such as um, transcriptomics, um, to see how their expression is in actual environment where we see the pressures of, say, if there's pressures from pH changes or different environmental factors. So that's kind of my comment as kind of a way to get from the lab to eventually the rock record. And I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Any response from our panel? Throughout a lot of this discussion, it's, oh, uh, it seems like we, we kind of are coming down on two different sorts of proxies. There's those that are targeting major element cycles that you actually try to look at abundance and or metrics for abundance, um, say using isotopes to back out the size of a particular reservoir. And then there are some that are more so we're interested in diagenesis and taphonomy because just the simple presence of a certain compound or molecule is hugely informative. And both of those things, one thing that they share, I can say, is this aspect of diagenesis that um, the open chat has had a, had a script going on. So I'm curious if there are folks in particular, I know Frank Corsetti is contributing a lot to this, this discussion, um, want to chime in as to are there particular aspects of taphonomy or preservation that we're missing? Are there, are there simple things that we can do? Um, obviously, pressure and temperature are the things, that are the most obvious targets for, for knobs to turn, but is there anything else? Maybe while he's, he, Frank is, is thinking, let me uh, follow up on that. So I, Harry Elderfield famously talked about the lifespan of a proxy, and he talked about early on the, uh, the honeymoon period when everyone was very excited and you could do almost anything you wanted with it. 
And then it hit what I call the pit of despair, where everyone realized that it's not going to be quite as simple as we initially imagined. And then eventually you climb out of that for an individual proxy and find where the utility lies. And there's always some, but it's never what you imagined initially. And I think that's happening. I referred earlier to the to the renaissance that I think began in the in the late 1990s with Precambrian studies, and part of that was motivated by a very important 1999 biomarker paper and a, and a number of other things that came out following that. And so I think we're we're facing that a bit right now, where um, we had new tools that were valid, validated and developed in modern systems and experimental systems, and everyone got very excited. And we were able to say a lot of things, and I think we're now. Um, going through some reality checks about the certainly with organic biomarkers going through checks about what these things really are telling us and and how they can be sustained and preserved under a variety of conditions and so i think we're a little bit in the pit of despair for a number of these things it's probably unfairly deep and so it's an exciting time to uh, to come out with a lot of these things too but to get out of that pit but i think importantly it's really essential as many people are typing along that to, and saying that we need to really think about that we need to revisit all of this with a much more sophisticated view of the effects of burial history, and certainly we always did that, but probably not well enough. And so, it's uh, there's lots of opportunity there. Thank you, Tim. I'm I'm just wondering for those of you who think about experimental um, diagenesis or taphonomy, and I see there's some discussion now getting more precise about a problem with. Um, time scales uh, and just scaling in general. If there are disciplines that are not typically included within the NASA umbrella that could be um, recruited to help us tackle these type of scaling issues that would bring thoughts from another um, disciplinary community that would, would be helpful. If any of you work with these people or are even aware of uh, the fact that these type of individuals who, um, may may exist. Thank you, Diane. While people are thinking that, Frank has his hand raised. Yeah, Diane, speaking about, you know, who else could we draw in? <clears throat> um, I've been making overtures to the um, dental school at USC because think about a lot of what they do, they work on biofilms that, you know, calcify on your teeth and how to get rid of those and how that process works. And they think about a lot of things that are very different from what we think about, but ultimately we're kind of looking at a, a similar thing. You know, we end up with this crusty thing that we wonder, you know, how do microbes interact with that? So um, that's another area I think, you know, that we could potentially ex explore. Just talk to these other people that have a vastly different interest and maybe something they've discovered can help us and vice versa, you know. So anyway, there you go. Thank you. We have about eight minutes remaining. We, uh, this conversation will, uh, as I say, will be transcribed and put onto the website uh, straight after this event. So we would like the conversation to continue uh, please, on the website. But in our last eight minutes, any other questions that uh, NASA should be considering as important questions to support the astrobiology roadmap? There was some early discussion in the online open chat about different um, environmental targets, different extreme environments, or potential analog habitats. You know, beyond um, the ones that we naturally flock to most quickly, which are kind of hydrothermal systems and stuff like that, are there other places that we should be looking today? You know, employing a lot of the modern molecular and microbial uh, techniques and things that we have available to us. Uh, go ahead, Ron. 
Hi. Uh, I'd just like to chime in on that. Uh, even though I work on uh, uh, saline alkaline lakes, uh, those are pretty good analogies for uh, what we might encounter under the regolith of Mars or in the uh, uh, moons of the outer planets. Uh, hypersaline uh, brines uh, in, uh, beneath the ice, for example, due to cryoconcentration. I think those these very saline environments are worth looking at uh, in addition to the uh, spreading centers. Okay, bye. Thank you. Other questions? Raise your hand. We can drag you into the conversation. Um, I have a question I'd like to throw out there. Um, how do people feel about NASA investing more in development of uh, bioinformatic uh, platforms that the community could use to, you know, really be able to effectively parse the wealth of sequence data that is now becoming ever more readily available to us. You know, within the next five years, the sequencing of single cells is likely to become very easy. And what I'm wondering is if this is something that the community feels they're going to be using in their research, and if so, are they well equipped to do it? And if not, um, what would be needed in order to make use of those, those resources? Chad, would you like to join in quickly in the last few minutes? Yes, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Hi, right, this is Chad. Yeah, I was going to answer Diane's question. You know, as a biologist, you know, we're challenged with the ease of getting sequence data now. It's, it's relatively easy and the costs are coming down, but it's our, our problem is dealing with how do you actually manage and analyze all the sequence data. I mean, we can't do that on our laptops and, and external hard drives. So I think... Um, you know, there's lots of talk about using, like, Amazon cloud computing and, and calling up, like, massive parallel computers and just for, like, hourly purposes. Um, but, you know, obviously we need to um, have collaborations with bioinformaticists who really know what they're doing. So I, I think, you know, having investment in computational biology um, and, and funding those projects that do have collaborations I think would be really valuable. Um, I don't know about investing in NASA supercomputers, but, you know, that, that might be a possibility as well as, as just aiding biologists who, who have the desire to do these massive, you know, sequencing projects but need, need the, the computational power to get it done, the analysis part. Thanks. Um. I see that there's some interesting comments coming on now um, about going beyond sequencing. Jake Bailey and Paula Wielander and Arpita Bose have just chimed in on the importance of funding to culture bugs and do genetics in, in them. Um, maybe could one of you elaborate on, on what you mean? Bearing in mind, we have two more minutes left. Paul has his hand. Paula, have your hand up. Okay, I'm here. Sorry, very quickly, just to um, you know, um, reiterate what um, Jake just said on the chat is that all this information, bioinformatics data that we get, is huge, and we have a lot of it. And I agree that we need some way to really process it all together. Because right now, I find myself using HodgePodge, a program from here and a program from there, and figuring out how to do it myself. If there was more of a, of a central way of doing that, would be great. But we also need to expand that and beyond that. We get all this data. What do we do with it? And I think it brings us back to classic genetics, classic microbiology. We need to go back and understand what these unknown genes are doing, and that requires funding more microbial geneticists and molecular biologists to really get at that question. Thanks. 
Can I just throw out one other thing? As, as, as people are sitting and thinking and continuing this discussion, which I hope they will, one thing that we haven't really talked about at all, for those of us who work in the early earth, the ultimate limitation of most of the things that we do um, is accessibility to good material that's well dated. And so one thing that we all might think about are what our limitations are in, in terms of those things, including the access to good cleanly drilled material, um, and there certainly is a lot of activity happening, but much more could happen in that regard. And also working in new innovative ways, I think, with the geochronology community to try and better better date those things, especially as we get deeper and deeper into time. So that's another topic, I think, and think generally about what we don't have now that we would, would like to have more of. Tim, thank you very much indeed. We, by my calculation, we are now to, at the end of the, this conference. Uh, we want this uh, uh, conversation to continue. So again, we encourage everybody to uh, go to the website uh, as soon as this event is over and look at some of the other themes. A transcription of this chat uh, will be up online very shortly, and we will uh, we'll be seeing you soon. Am I seeing, am I seeing Mary there? Is Mary wanting to say something? Good. All right. In which case, say that once again, Mary, please. I had to step out, and I was off camera, so I just decided to step in. Say hi to everyone. It's a delight to have you here. And, and Thank you very much, everybody. We'll uh, see you again in the next conference in, in a couple of hours' time. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye.